We are delighted to have Dr. Suzanne Schwartz at CyberMed today. She is incredibly busy, as are all of you, and so we are so thankful that she took time out of her schedule to join us. And just really quickly, I do want to hit a couple of points regarding her career, because I think it's a very inspirational path for young physicians like Christian and myself. Um, Dr. Schwartz received her medical degree from the Albert Einstein College of Medicine in, of Yeshiva University in New York, and she trained clinically in general surgery and burn trauma, which is about as intense as you can get. Um, she served patients at the Cornell Medical Center in New York for many years, and also at that same time advanced the basic science of burn care as the associate director of the New York Firefighters Wound Healing Research Laboratory. So the classic triple threat um, of clinical medicine research. And then she went on to receive an executive MBA from the NYU Stern School of Business and joined the FDA in 2010, where she very uh, quickly acquired a number of different responsibilities. So give me a chance here. I hope I don't mess this up. She is the Associate Director of Science and Strategic Partnerships, as well as the Director of Emergency Preparedness Operations and Medical Countermeasures at the Center for Devices and Radiologic Health uh, at the FDA. And really why Christian and I are so uh, in awe of her and so happy that she's here today is that she has probably saved hundreds if not thousands of lives in her work as a clinical surgeon, but now with her role as an expert in medical cybersecurity policy and a thought leader who's been working with amazing researchers like Bo, Josh, and Scott, and clinicians and bringing stakeholders together, she's really gonna save countless more. So we're so thrilled to have her. Please welcome Dr. Suzanne Swartz. Thank you for that. Just you know, very, very warm, heartwarming felt welcome. I can't begin to tell you how much we at FDA appreciate the opportunity, the privilege uh, to participate in this effort, this event that took place over the past two days. It is for us just beyond, beyond our delight to be able to do so because it really is a part of what is really historic in nature, what you've accomplished here. And I you know, wanna say that for FDA's, from FDA's perspective, we think that this should be a model that can be reproduced across many other organizations and universities in the United States as a means of really expanding the awareness and demonstrating the capabilities that clinicians will have with regard to medical device security and the ability to influence in that area. So our mantra from the very beginning when we first started with dealing medical device cybersecurity several years ago has really been all about fostering collaboration, about bringing that whole of community together. We've always said that this is about shared ownership and shared responsibility. In order to safeguard our patients, we believe that it is critical to harness that collective will and to create that culture of multi-stakeholder collaboration. And yet, while every stakeholder has a role and has a part to play, you, this audience, really those who are boots on the ground, clinicians, hands on patients, interacting directly with devices and the environment, you are really uniquely poised in order to be able to make a difference in advancing the state of healthcare cybersecurity at large and then most specifically in the realm of medical device cybersecurity. And all in the service of your patients and advancing patient care. And, and this isn't just platitudes that I'm offering here. How so? So I want to be very concrete about it. So first off, you are already trained to systematically think through differential diagnoses when patients present before you. And as we all saw yesterday, the importance of being able to integrate information that's coming in through the environment in order to further impact on clinical outcomes. Secondly, 
patients look to you for guidance with respect to decisions that they have to make about their health care. And the more knowledge and understanding that you are able to bring about medical devices, connectivity, medical device vulnerabilities and security, the better empowered you are to be able to have those kinds of conversations, that dialogue with patients to help inform their decision making. F FDA, we have at the Center for Devices and Radiological Health put into place a strategic priority over the past two years that emphasizes partnering with patients because we recognize that patients and patient-centric care has to be elevated to the forefront and that patient preferences with respect to decisions that an individual will make for his or her own specific set of circumstances, environment, are really critical. They're integral to the decision-making process. And that speaks to across all of medical devices and all different topic areas. But as you'll see even in the next presentation that Marie Mo gives, it becomes really important with respect to medical device cybersecurity as well. So in order for being able to have a discussion with patients on their individual preferences in an educated manner, it becomes really important for physicians to be empowered and skilled in that knowledge in understanding what that benefit risk calculus so that indeed the patient and the physician can partner in ultimately delivering what is optimum for that individual. Third, the more involved that you are, the more effective voice you have, and the more that you are therefore able to influence and to share your perspective so that the needs, the concerns that you have can be addressed as part of what is a broader campaign in healthcare for proactive cyber hygiene. And I think, again, what Scott spoke about in the earlier talk, we recognize, as a physician, I certainly recognize that there are concerns that clinicians have with respect to how security could potentially impede the need for an emergent or urgent care. Clearly, what we want to be able to do is have your voice and have you with a seat at the table so that care is not compromised or put in jeopardy, but rather we have the capability of enhancing patient care while addressing cybersecurity at the same time. So what is in you know, the bottom line up front? And these slides, while they were geared more towards a medical device manufacturer audience as well as healthcare delivery organizations in a broader sense, really have a impact upon all of us here. Number one, at FDA, it has been for us about fostering a culture not only of collaboration, but one of continuous quality improvement and recognizing that it doesn't stop at the time of design and development of a medical device, but rather there's a need for addressing on a continuum throughout the entire product life cycle. From the time that product goes out into distribution through its use at the patient's bedside and until it's retired. Cybersecurity is going to evolve, vulnerabilities will evolve over the lifetime of that device and they will continue to emerge. And so this concept of viewing it holistically, what we call TPLC, the total product life cycle approach, is one that we embrace and that we have asked for all of our stakeholders to embrace. Why is that important for this audience? Because this concept of continuous quality improvement is also at the very core of what you do with respect to outcomes of patient care and always looking to do better, 
always looking to recognize where there are areas for potential improvement. And being those eyes and ears as well at the patient's bedside or in the clinic, wherever that may be, to recognize where there could be a signal around a problem and to be able to bring that forward. But you have to have that awareness and education piece first. Our focus at FDA has also been on this concept of proactive, comprehensive risk management. And when I say proactive, it's in moving away from that very you know, reactive stance. So we're not going to wait for patients to be hurt, for patients to be harmed in order to make, to formulate new policy or take certain stands. As we become aware, FDA, along with manufacturers and healthcare delivery organizations and clinicians and patients working together around potential risks that we consider to be unacceptable risks, risks that have to be brought down to a acceptable level through different actions or mitigations, we want to be able to communicate those and see that those actions are taken again before harm occurs. So th this is a shift, a paradigm shift, and I think we heard a little bit about this yesterday uh, from Josh, uh, from how FDA traditionally takes in information based upon adverse events and then based upon digesting that information and analyzing it determines to working with a manufacturer or manufacturers what needs to happen next. So Scott mentioned earlier that uh, we should think about the fact that we're not unique, and that is true. I mean, there are some unique elements, but one thing that FDA has drawn a lot from are the experiences and the perspectives and the lessons learned from many other sectors of critical infrastructure outside of healthcare and leveraging the learnings from other centers, other, other sectors and working together with the public and private sphere in terms of developing the appropriate kinds of frameworks and establishing various policies that have worked elsewhere that can be translated and utilized within the medical device ecosystem within this com healthcare community. So examples of those that we have underscored as being really important include not only is yes, adoption of the NIST framework, but also establishing and communicating processes for vulnerability intake and handling, and adopting coordinated disclosure policies and practices, and very important, deploying mitigations in order to address risks early, prior to that vulnerability actually being exploited. How do we kind of accomplish this? And I'll go through a little bit of our journey in a, in a few slides, but it's really by bringing stakeholders from the traditional ecosystem and well beyond together as part of this dialogue, as part of teaching us, as part of educating us around these concepts, these policies that are in existence, and talking about further socializing, how can we have those policies inform activities within the healthcare space. Bottom line, you know, the common thread that's going to go throughout my talk here is that this is about collaboration, that, you know, again, there is no single organization or part of an ecosystem that is in a position to, on its own, raise the bar, that we all have to be able to work together in this realm. And then another important concept that extends from there is this idea of collaborative information sharing for cyber vulnerabilities and threats. We think that that's really important. So from our perspective, we envision this as a continuous cycle, a continuous feedback loop, one that doesn't you know, uh, have a stop at any point, but rather what we learn through our engagement with multiple stakeholders can further inform 
our uh, not only awareness around vulnerabilities or potential threats, but that it, it helps inform our regulatory policy position. The guidances that we have put out over the past few years, both on the pre-market side and on the post-market side, were very much driven and informed by bringing, by convening our stakeholders and understanding what's important, what's feasible, what has worked elsewhere, what might not be a good idea to do. And while there's a formal process for comments that come in to guidance when it's issued in draft, and we make use of that process in a formal manner, I think what has been very advantageous for us in cybersecurity is that we set up more of a foundation of welcoming and, op and allowing an openness and a transparency around dialogue from stakeholders from the very beginning so that it, it didn't take and it continues not to take a formal mechanism for whether it's manufacturers, whether it's healthcare delivery organizations, whether it's professional societies of clinicians, whether it's patients, whether it's security researchers, whether it's other federal partners, whether it's our uh, congressional uh, uh, stakeholders as well to engage with us and to bring to our attention challenge areas, pain points, things that they think are good ideas, not such good ideas, and that has really helped this process of coming out with guidance that we think is a solid foundation, a solid framework upon which cybersecurity and medical devices will continue to advance. So I want to take a moment <laughs> to step back and talk about some myth busters. And myth busters are what they are and because we have been able to dialogue closely and have that level of engagement with stakeholders and they've been able to provide information to us as to what some of that like legend is out there that becomes important for us to dispel. So there's been a lot of over over the years and, and I have to tell you that through WannaCry we continue to hear this. So we've not been successful in entirely dispelling this myth around patching of medical devices. Um, FDA encourages the patching of medical devices. We've never stated that one has to come back to the agency for quote unquote recertification of a device in order to provide the updates to that medical device in order to enhance its cybersecurity. In fact, the post-market guidance specifically calls this out as cybersecurity routine updates and patches. Those types of enhancements that are made to, to a device in order to improve, in order to strengthen the cybersecurity of that device. We absolutely don't want to be an impediment in terms of medical device manufacturers being able to make changes to their device in order to provide a, uh, a, a more rigorous stance. So that's one particular uh, myth that we, again, need the help very much of this audience and healthcare delivery organizations at large to be able to do that kind of pushing back, as Scott just described in his prior talk of, no, 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 that's not what we've heard from FDA. That's not what we've seen in guidance. That's not what's on their website with regard to their fact sheet. Yes, manufacturer, you, you know, you can uh, provide patches to these devices uh, without having to necessarily engage the FDA. So that's important to note. The other myth that gets talked a lot about is that, well, don't you FDA need a new regulation for cybersecurity? Um, who, do you really have oversight or authority in this particular area? And what we've, ex and especially since it's included within guidance. And I'm not sure about you know, how, how much this audience really understands what the role, what the purpose is of FDA guidance. But guidance allows 
enough latitude for industry, for the medical device manufacturer to meet, to satisfy the requirements that are defined in statute or regulation without defining a prescriptive process. So it provides what our recommendations and the guidance will say on the, on the second page, these are non-binding recommendations, but that's not the end of the sentence. That's not where the period lies, okay? Um, the recommendations are in the how-to. It's what we think, as our thinking continues to evolve, is the best way for industry to get to meet the rigor of cybersecurity and of meeting what becomes the quality system regulation, which is the overarching framework in which one would include the understanding of cybersecurity. But it isn't to say by any means that cybersecurity is optional, that manufacturer can choose not to undertake it. And I think if you were to go back and look at activities that the agency has taken, that we have taken over the past year, that it will be pretty obvious that it's not optional with respect to making sure that devices that are on the market have the appropriate cybersecurity controls um, and that also new devices that are coming on the market that we have the capability and we have exercised that already in terms of holding that device from actually being given what's called the clearance, the marketing clearance or approval for distribution until we believe that the cybersecurity questions and controls around that device from the standpoint of what was submitted to the agency are adequately, are most satisfactorily addressed. So I'm, I'm going kind of slowly here on some things, but I, I want to also offer the opportunity if, if there's questions that people can ask me questions while I'm speaking, uh, particularly because this can get into a little heavy policies related stuff, and if something isn't clear, then it's better to ask me before we go forward. So please don't, you know, rather this be a dialogue than me just speaking. So healthcare public health is one of the 16 sectors of critical infrastructure, and um, we can't emphasize enough how much of a soft target this is and what a large attack surface it is. I think that you know, the events in the past year have demonstrated that, and there's no reason to think that that isn't going to continue or further escalate as time goes on. And that, for that reason, we need to be in a better prepared position to deal with these types of intrusions and breaches and potential exploits that can impact on patient care ultimately. So how did we, you know, what was the framework in which we got started uh, several years ago? We utilized back in 2013 the executive orders that were, and the presidential policy directive that was issued as a means of giving us kind of that template by which we saw ourselves needing to participate in. And I think that this statement from the executive order becomes really important because it emphasizes the key messages, the uh, most critical components of what ends up being our policy approach. This idea of a partnership between owners and operators of critical infrastructure, information, cybersecurity information sharing, and the idea of collaboration, collaboratively developing and implementing risk-based standards. So the background context with which we designed our original pre-market guidance and then continued to build upon that, the platform for the post-market guidance, are these original executive orders. It includes also this idea of alignment with the NIST framework to strengthen critical infrastructure cybersecurity. And specifically within that, for those who are familiar with the framework, there are five core functions that are called out. They are identify, protect, 
detect, respond, and recover. And what we did was we took those five core functions and we did the crosswalk to how does that apply within healthcare to the medical device space? What might that mean, that identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover for industry, for medical device manufacturers, as well as for healthcare delivery organizations and thinking about vulnerabilities and protection of systems. Furthermore, in 2015, a subsequent executive order was issued that spoke to this concept of establishing information sharing and analysis organizations, or ISOs. And we leverage that concept of ISAO on the post-market front. We think, and it goes to a much, much broader context well beyond healthcare and public health, that this idea of enabling information sharing for threats and vulnerabilities across multiple critical infrastructure sectors and across those within the healthcare public se health sector are best undertaken in order to be able to be more prepared and to be in a better position of defense and ability to fend off any types of intrusions, breaches, and exploits to patients. So as I was preparing this talk, I thought, well, you know, several years have gone by since we've started this process, and it's really important that we be honest with ourselves and reflect back on what we observed and what we've heard as challenges that go back several years and kind of take, a, uh, take stock of where we are at present. So I pulled slides from a post-workshop that we had done. This was the first workshop in 2014 that we conducted after we released our pre-market guidance. And um, while this workshop was in many ways also a milestone in terms of bringing together stakeholders from across the ecosystem, it brought to the fore what many of the challenges are that we were hearing from different stakeholder groups. So as I look these over right now, it's very useful because it enables us to really see where have we made some advances, where has there been incremental improvement, and what remains a you know, very difficult, uh, complex challenge area for which we still are somewhat stuck and need to be able to, again, rally all of our stakeholders to help improve those areas. Systemic challenges were those that were considered to be quite pervasive, and um, in many ways, these are intended not to be unique to healthcare and public health, but you could ask any sector of critical infrastructure, and these are pervasive challenges that were expressed back in 2014 that the cyber threat is growing, that it's not on the radar of the C-suite, that is there really a space that is safe or trusted for information sharing? This idea of a lack of a common vernacular, a lack of a common lexicon. What about standards for device integration and maintenance, that there's no one-size-fits-all solution? And this isn't merely a design issue. Again, it is a life cycle issue. Then we also can dig a little bit deeper, and these were specific challenges that different stakeholders expressed in 2014. Well, lack of trust. Something that we talked about yesterday, trust in big letters was across one of the slides, and I think it was Josh, your slide, um, this idea of trust, trust and empathy. So lack of trust becomes an area that um, we're, you know, we're, we will have to continue to work on. In fact, I don't think one can ever stop working on building trust. This idea of cybersecurity being addressed in silos as opposed to recognizing the fact that it crosses so many different domains and that there's a need for education and understanding of what it is like to, you know, to be standing in somebody else's shoes 
whether it's the biomed engineer, whether it's the clinician, the manufacturer, the security researcher, whoever that might be, the patient. We heard a lot about cybersecurity researchers bringing disruption to the community. And when I say disruption here, that's meant in a neutral way, disruption in a, in a manner that because it's, it's really kind of shaking up the ecosystem as to maybe we need to be doing things differently. And then a lot of smaller organizations, whether they're on the healthcare delivery organization side or whether they are on the medical device manufacturing side, just simply do not have sufficient resources in-house or expertise in order to address cybersecurity as it's continuing to emerge. Further challenges that were addressed by stakeholders. Not sure how vulnerability should be prioritized. We, we've heard like yesterday a, a single medical device could have hundreds or thousands of vulnerabilities. Every medical device that's connected has vulnerabilities. We know that. Not every vulnerability, however, mounts to being a patient safety concern. But how does one therefore set up a system of prioritizing or triaging vulnerabilities so that they can be addressed in a manner that is going to reduce any concerns around patient safety? And probably one of the most important and ongoing issues that we find ourselves dealing with is trying to make the business case for why cybersecurity investments need to be made. What's the value proposition? And unfortunately, I think that it's only when events, incidents such as WannaCry or others occur and that they impact on an individual organization, is there a wake-up call, a call to action? But it would be great if we could figure out that way and there could be more than one way of approaching this in terms of understanding how within an organization individuals can champion the cause here and can develop that business case, that compelling argument as to why it's important to invest in cybersecurity, whether it's on the healthcare organization side or on the medical device manufacturing side, as a means of protecting and improving care. So this gives you a sense of our journey as it continues. In fact, there's probably more that we can add to 2017 that we've not had a chance to update on this slide as yet. But um, what it does shed light on are the kind of cornerstone principles by which we have uh, approached cybersecurity with this idea of collaboration, coordination, communication on the collaboration on the public and private side, as well as with federal partners. Coordination, we do a lot with our partners in Department of Homeland Security, Industrial Control System, Cyber Emergency Response Team. We, uh, we work very, very closely with this organization and have found them to be uh, extraordinarily important to the work that has to be done in the medical device space for security and communication articulated through policy, our guidances, as well as through meetings like this, as well as through blogs, as well as through safety communications where we've written several safety communications over the years, whether they were on a more general terms in ter as far as, again, raising that situational awareness around medical device security, or whether they were product specific and we'll continue to do that. You know, I think that what's important to just note here, and I, I want to emphasize this, is this is a journey. And we are going to continue to focus on where must we improve upon, what you know, needs to be revisited, whether it's on the policy side, whether it's with respect to activities, whether we need to be looking in new places or different places, 
clearly this is going to be an effort that's just going to continue uh, to take a lot of focus, a lot of attention, and that we, we need the passionate folks like you who are invested and understand what the importance is in this particular area so that new advances, new innovation within the medical device space as these great new technologies come to market that we're not introducing unknown risks that, uh, that where we'd be thinking about them from a security perspective, we could, we could be doing better. So I'm going to go through the next, like the, my last set of slides, pretty quickly, just giving you some highlights here. And anyone who wants to have further uh, sidebar discussion with me on more of the specifics, myself and from my team, Dr. Seth Carmody is here. We're happy to do so. But again, um, from a policy standpoint, we issued a pre-market guidance in October 2014. Takeaway here is we need to be able to build or bake security into the design of these devices as they are going through the development process. And over the past few years, the work that we've been doing together with medical device manufacturers has been to also emphasize to manufacturers, don't wait until you're ready to actually submit to us that 510K or that pre-market approval, pre-market application, excuse me, for a class two or a class three device to tell us about how you're going to deal with cybersecurity in that device. Come to us early, come to us often, set up a pre-submission meeting with us, engage us in a conversation about what does your roadmap look like for bringing cybersecurity into the new generation of devices or new technologies so that A, we have awareness of what's coming down the pike and that we can also advise as to whether we think that's adequate or whether we need to be prepared to take a, you know, a, a different approach. But we want to be able to enable that advancement of technology without having to impede it from getting to market at the very, very last minute. So important to be working early on on the innovation side. We know that even with addressing what our pre-market controls, controls, excuse me, we know that even with a manufacturer doing their utmost to develop threat models and to do the hazards analysis and to address security at the time of design and development, that those controls may very well not be adequate over the lifetime of that device. And that's why it is so important to have the post-market guidance with this concept of using a risk-based framework in order to address risks to public health in a timely manner. As I mentioned before, this isn't optional. We base, we ground the post-market guidance in the quality system regulation. What we wanted to do, though, which is really important, is to provide an incentive for manufacturers in order to make changes and to address types of issues that arise that could be of a public health nature early on. And so we built in what you could call a regulatory incentive into that guidance. <clears throat> From the time that uh, the draft guidance was issued in January of 2016 through when it was finalized in December of 2016, we took to heart a lot of the important and very highly valued comment that came to the agency, again, through formal public docket, as well as through a lot of discussions, whether it's with the trade organizations, with healthcare delivery organizations, with the security researchers and others. And this gives you a kind of a, a summary of, if I had to bucket the changes that were made into four categories, this is, these are the four changes. We wanted to make sure that while it's going to important to address concerns in a timely and an expedient manner, that it be one that's actually feasible as well. 
because the last thing that we want to do is have a manufacturer hurry to address something and at the same time, in trying to make changes to address a patient safety concern, introduce new risks that are, were not identified at the time of that change. So what is it you know, uh, about cybersecurity that's different? We, we talk about assessing risk, and we use two different factors um, in order to do so. We're, we're looking at what that severity of patient harm is, if the vulnerability that's identified were to be exploited, and then we're looking at what is the exploitability, and we're asking manufacturers to consider what is the exploitability of that vulnerability. And this is the schematic that appears in our post-market guidance, which gives you a sense of, again, along the y-axis, exploitability and severity of patient harm on the x-axis with this concept of taking what are established already standards or tools that we recommend be utilized by a manufacturer in order to determine is that risk of a vulnerability to be exploited considered to be in the controlled bucket, or is it in what we would consider to be uncontrolled or unacceptable risk, an intolerable risk that has to be brought down uh, with respect to that particular device. So the severity of patient harm is familiar to medical device manufacturers. This is uh, language that is consistent with, with accepted standards. Exploitability, however, for many, is a new concept to introduce. And the reason that this becomes important is because we can't associate probabilities or probability al alone in, an assess in this type of an assessment. For the very reason that we've talked about over the past two days, we don't know, we are not aware of cases. There's no statistics out there. This is not a probabilistic determination with regard to exploitability of a device. So other variables have to be considered and have to be weighted in that consideration. We recommend using something right now that's called a common vulnerability scoring system, a CVSS, and you could see the different parts of the different factors that are considered in that scoring. But there could be other scoring systems or tools that are utilized. This is one of multiple. And I will say parenthetically that we recognize that there are also some challenges with applying the CVSS as it presently exists to the clinical environment, to the medical environment, which has been you know, brought to our attention multiple times. It's for this reason that we have an effort underway working with our partners at MITRE that has engaged across all stakeholders a means of taking the CVSS and adapting it as a tool for the clinical environment, for medical devices. And that rubric that's being developed right now, this is an ongoing effort. Penny Chase is here from MITRE. Penny, if you want to raise your hand, if anybody's interested as well in participating in that. I think that we are always interested in engaging um, new parties. And this is important because we're going to take that as a, and create that into what's called a medical device development tool, an MDDT, that can then be open sourced and used by healthcare delivery organizations and manufacturers and others as a means of using the CVSS geared more towards the medical device and the, and the clinical environment so that exploitability will be more easily translatable to our world. And severity, again, uh, this comes from a standard that has been recognized by the FDA, ISO 14971. I mentioned this concept of information sharing and analysis organizations, four principles, essentially, of such an organization, that they be inclusive, actionable, transparent, and trusted. 
and there are ISAOs that are presently in formation or that have already been stood up. We wanted to be clear about defining what the criteria are for active participation by a medical device manufacturer and an ISAO. And that becomes important to us because that is actually one of the criteria by which a manufacturer can receive the incentive not to have to report to the FDA when an uncontrolled vulnerability has been identified and mitigated. So just kind of to talk through this kind of uh, at a level that will be um, easily understandable, I mentioned earlier that the guidance speaks about controlled risk versus uncontrolled risk. And that using the parameters that we established, the severity of patient harm and exploitability, one would make a determination. So with respect to that risk of patient harm, if that vulnerability were, um, did not pose that type of a risk, then any changes that a manufacturer were to be making fall into that category of, let's see if we can do this here, mm. changes, oops, sorry about that. changes that are routine updates and patches or device enhancements. If there is a risk of patient harm, then again, we are dealing with either controlled or uncontrolled. If they're controlled, once more, similar to here, these would be considered routine updates and patches or device enhancements. They do not need to come back to the agency for certification or for any type of particular notification. However, if they are uncontrolled, again, intolerable risk of patient harm as is, if that ex vulnerability were to be exploited, then depending upon whether these three criteria are met, e the, the manufacturer may be able to derive the incentive that they do not need to report to us, something that's called Part 806 which basically means that is a report of what are called corrections and removals. So what are those three criteria? That there were, there's no awareness of an adverse event that's occurred as a result of that vulnerability. That's, it's remediated within a pre-established timeline, that 30, 60 day phasing that I had on a previous slide, and that the manufacturer is an active participant in an information sharing and analysis organization. So again, just to highlight what are controlled vulnerabilities, we want to be able to promote this concept of good cyber hygiene so that even when residual risks are considered to be acceptable, that the manufacturer is incentivized to make additional changes, to make those kinds of changes that's going to improve cybersecurity even further. And here we have it again, these changes to a device solely to strengthen cybersecurity associated with a vulnerability of controlled risk. These are routine updates and patches. They are not, they are considered, typically considered to be device enhancements. They are not required to be reported. This is right out of our guidance. This is what I talked about in that initial myth buster. So just important to kind of keep that piece in mind. So those uncontrolled vulnerabilities, again, we laid out a framework that would provide an incentive to a manufacturer to be more expedient in addressing those uncontrolled vulnerabilities by defining what are, first of all, the actual reporting requirements. And if those, in, if the three criteria for the incentives are any one of them are not met, a manufacturer has to, not should, but they have to report that kind of an uncontrolled vulnerability. I'm 
pausing there for a second because I want people to make, uh, understand that, um, that that is an actual reporting requirement that would be considered under Part 806. And that's without harm having had occurred. We specify what the time frame is for mitigating risks. What does disclosure look like from the standpoint of communicating to the to stakeholders, first of all to customers as well as to the community at large? And what does it mean to participate in an ISAL? All right, and I just said this in the previous slide, that, you, that vulnerabilities that are of uncontrolled nature, they have to be reported to the agency. However, here's the incentive piece, and this is, you know, this clinches it. We would not enforce reporting requirements under this provision if all three of these cri three criteria are met, hence the incentive here. All right, well, I'm winding down to the end here. <laughs> and again, once more, these are the key takeaways. It is all about collaboration. We wouldn't be where we are today if it wasn't for the fact that we have so many parts of the stakeholder community currently engaged and working with us, and we value those partnerships highly. I'd be remiss if I didn't call out early on um, the work that Josh and Bo have done together and with I Am the Cavalry as well as the sponsorship of Atlantic Council in really being able to help us move the needle here. But we have a lot more work to be done. We're not going to you know, stand here and pat ourselves on the back. There's a lot that has to be undertaken. And we need to move quickly. You know, that's probably my biggest concern. And so this event, I want to come back around to really expressing my utmost appreciation to Christian and to Jeff and to the university, first of all, in terms of having the, uh, the passion and the vision um, towards putting it together because um, this, to me, is the beginning of a new journey, one that we absolutely must build upon with our clinician community and others within the healthcare delivery organization um, stakeholders. So thank you.